Cotney Attorneys and Consultants is dedicated to helping the construction industry with legal, business, and safety challenges. Welcome to this week's episode of Law & Mortar with John Kenny and Trent Cotney. Hey, this is Trent Cotney, CEO of Cotney Attorneys and Consultants. I'd like to welcome everybody to another episode of Law & Mortar. As always, I've got the man, the myth, the legend, John Kenny. John, how are you doing? I'm doing great. And again, it's great to be here. Another one. Another week, another week down. Yeah, I know. This has been a great week for us. We've had a lot of really uh, you know, good things going on, which is always a great way to end the week. But um, one of the biggest issues that the industry is facing now, and we've talked about it in several podcasts. Um, I did an RCA webinar recently, uh, and we are going to do another webinar, which I'll talk about uh, here shortly on this. But the material shortages and material price increases um, have, you know, kind of gotten to the point where they are a, a crisis level threat to the industry. And it's been percolating for a while now. You know, we've talked about how to negotiate with suppliers, you know, in industry updates. I've talked about, you know, um, contract revisions that you can include in there. But one thing that we really haven't discussed that I would like to spend a little bit of time on is um you know engaging in the use of substitutions on projects now from a legal standpoint contractually you want to make sure that your contract says that that allows for reasonable substitutions clearly if you've got you know a specialty type project that that's spec you know copper gutters copper gutters are copper gutters so i mean not you know there's some other things you can do there to make it look like copper gutters but at the end of the day um, you're kind of stuck with that. But if there are other types of materials that can be used in lieu of that, uh, you want to make sure that you have the capability of, of uh, selecting those choices. So classic example is if, let's say, um, you know, a certain uh, manufacturer is called out, if there is a similar uh, manufacturer that could be used, you know, similar performance uh, values and qualities, what you want to do is make sure that your contract allows for those reasonable substitutions. Um, if it does, then it shouldn't necessarily be an issue. And John, you know, why don't you talk about it from the real world perspective? You know, what did you see out in the field and give some examples of uh, substitutions that you had to kind of deal with um, while you were a contractor? Yeah, so a couple quick things on this. Um, one is, you know, we've heard from some people that haven't experienced this yet. Now, I got to tell you, that's pretty rare. Um, I'll, you know, we're hearing nationwide and up into Canada that this is becoming a very large issue. Um, not, it's not limited to anything in particular, but going down the list just real quick, metal is very difficult to get. Um, it, it, whether it's copper, galvanized, aluminum, but galvanized got whatever's high demand. That's one of the hardest. Insulation screws and fasteners. So there's other things too, but let's focus on those for the purpose of what you just had said for real world. Metal, you're right. There's probably not much you're going to do in that. So here's, here's something you can do. Get them to pick the earth color as early as absolute possible as you can in the project. Let them know when you submit in for the metal, if it's got a color to it, like a Kynar finish on the galvanizer or aluminum and so on, that you need this color picked immediately because of the fact it is going to take you probably 50% longer to get, or I mean 100%, double the time as you normally get. That should help because there's not much you can do in substitutions really with that. Insulation, that brings us to a good point of what you said about make sure it's in your contract. But let's just say you got a manufacturer that has specified a total systems warranty. So they, they want you're going to buy the fasteners, insulation, membrane, all accessories from them. And you go to place your order, and this just happened with somebody that called me up on a consulting issue the other day. They couldn't get the insulation from this manufacturer. And the manufacturer said, I, I don't know what to do um, to tell you to do, but if you can find it, we're willing to work with you to substitute as long as we know the manufacturer we're using. So there was a great example. The roofer was able to go out, find a manufacturer that would sell to them direct and, and that the manufacturer couldn't see it. So again, that's an option. The other option is always do that ahead of time. So if a manufacturer calls you up, you know you have the options. And sometimes when you put the pressure back on them, if they say, uh, no, we don't allow substitution, say, well, I need this material you can't deliver. I already know X can get it to me and I'm going to go to X. So you, it might help if it's available. Uh, screws and plates, same way. I mean, for the most part, 
again, this is not our, I don't want to get emails from our, our manufacturers of fasteners, but for the most part, all of the manufacturers of fasteners are approved under almost every system. So that's an option that you can look at if one manufacturer is available than another. Those are the real world. The other thing, last tip on this, Trent, you're right about the contract, know your rights, but I can tell you from an operational standpoint, please know up front, please do proper pre-jobs with your estimating team, know what products are being specified, know the availability with your vendor team. So you get this done early in the process, not a week before you, you need the material shipped. Yeah, those are some great points. And just to kind of piggyback off of that, you know, um, one of the things that that we've dealt with from the legal side is we had one roofing contractor substitute underlayment, you know, thinking that, ah, they're never going to see it. Who cares? Well, that's always when it ends up being a problem. So, yep. um, you know, honesty and, and managing customer expectations is the best course of action. The other thing to keep in mind is that we have seen significant lead times on a lot of key products. So, you know, um, foam, foam adhesive, paint, coatings, all those types of things, you can anticipate that there might be a longer lead time to get some of these products. So you really want to have communications with your supplier or your manufacturer about when you're going to get them. So John, I want to turn to our training center. You know, it's it's been a huge success. Uh, for those of you that haven't you know, seen video or photos of it. We have all our old roofing signs and roofing memorabilia up there. Uh, it's like a museum. There's more than 300 pieces, but we also have mock-ups of anything and everything that you would ever need. Low slope, steep slope, you name it, wall panels. And uh, we've had a lot of great opportunities to, you know, work with NRCA, work with other groups, but we're real excited, you know, and John and I, you and I were just talking today about, uh, about expanding our training center and mm -hmm. we're going to do that here shortly, but We've got a big event coming up, um, Delta Day, and why don't you kind of tell the audience a little bit about it and what they can expect? Yeah, Delta Day is an interesting day. So Delta Rep Group is a manufacturer's rep locally here, covers the state of Florida, and they you know, represent different manufacturers like, like a lot of rep groups do. So well, they're going to be coming in, and part of this event is going to be live on-site training with these various manufacturers, and that is a limited um, event by invitation only to come in through through the manufacturers in the in Delta Rep Group. But on top of that, we're opening it up pretty much to the entire world. Um, you'll understand in a minute why I say the entire world. So we're having a virtual training day going on corresponding at the same time where you're going to have various manufacturers. They will be at their home office. For example, somebody could be up in Maine that's a manufacturer and they're going to be joining us live in doing their demonstrations and product previews, which would be very interesting. So of course, we wanted to do one step further because we like to always do things to get the most bang for the industry dollar out there so they get to see it. So in the meantime, we've done some of the interviews. We're gonna have interviews that are going to be prior and in between all of these demonstrations that are going on. And we've really got some, uh, we'll get a little bit out now, but you can go on and see the promotions coming up, but we've talked, we have NRCA, we have Western States, we have the Canadian Roofing Association, we have IFD in Europe that came on, so there's your international aspect, uh, Florida Roofing Contractors and Sheet Metal Association, um, we have um, Chicago Roofing Contract Association, we have Roofers Coffee Shop, we have Roofers Contractor Magazine, Sales Transformation Group, and we have Rackley Roofing coming on. I believe I named everybody. If I didn't hear, go see our social media. I've got it all spelled out. So what that's doing is giving everyone that's listening a, a tidbit into what's going on. We've covered it from consulting in to the manufacturing in to the to the uh, to the uh, industry people, the associations, and a roofer. Give you a great perspective. Now the interesting part about this is we we're limited for time, so we'll have five minutes in between these. But these interviews are about 15 to 20 minutes. There'll be an after hours link going out afterwards where you can go see these in, in their entirety. And you'll want to do that. The fact that you get to listen to what's going on in Europe for 20 minutes, Canada, United States and the industry. Wow, that, that's amazing stuff right there. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I think if I remember right, we've got um, someone from National Women Roofing and National Roofing Partners, right? That's it. I, why, it. I'm glad to see Trent. That's why you're here. That was a lot for me to list off from memory. It's from, you know, it's the end of the day. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, on our social media, you'll be able to cover all this. 
Yeah, and, and one of the things that we want to do, obviously, there's only a limited amount of space on here, but there's so many more people that, that we'd like to talk to and do something similar to. So, um, you know, we anticipate that this is something that we'll probably continue to do in the future. It's just a great opportunity for segments of the industry to be heard that might not otherwise get uh, the podium to be able to do that. So uh, really looking forward to that. That's going to be great. I'm going to be watching. Um, you know, so I encourage everybody out there to make sure they turn in too. you know, to kind of stay on that theme, you know, mm -hmm. one of the things that I really enjoy the most about this job is obviously the advocacy and the stuff that you and I do, John, um, to fight for the industry and help the industry. You know, it's, it is, it's what I'm passionate about now. It's something that, um, helps motivate me and it, it keeps me, you know, wanting to do what we're doing. And one of the best things that, that we've done, you know, in recent years was, you know, not only work with, with groups and the contractors and the industry here in the United States, but, you know, develop tremendous relationships with Canada. Um, you know, Bob Burnett, everybody over at uh, CRCA has been just fantastic. Great contractors up there, uh, great manufacturers and suppliers, and really gotten to know people over there. But also, you know, IFD, the International uh, Federation for Roofing Trades, Pascal Cervati and Graham Miller and uh, Hans, everybody over at IFD have just been tremendous resources for us. And I know, John, you work with them closely. You know, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about uh, Cotney's involvement and your involvement with IFD? Yeah, so IFD is a great group. Um, roofing Association is a little bit different than here in the United States. As a roofer, or as a contractor, you don't belong directly to the IFD. The association, say if you're in the roofing association in Germany as a member, you're represented in the IFD through your association. So a little bit different. So by doing that, you got this group of representation that gets together. And, and on our end, we're a member from outside, which of course would be the US membership full member in there. So we get to participate. So what particularly I'm working with with them now is on two committees. One is on waterproofing and uh, flashing details for, you know, like decks, balconies, regular waterproofing like you'd have here in the USA as well. And the second part we're working on is gradient, which is the pitch of the roof and all the details that go along with it with height. So by working on that, what we're doing, we're actually putting together a recommendation manual, similar to what you would see here coming out of association that will be published. I believe the target is fall to fall of this year. Um, we're about 90% through in both groups. And then that will be distributed out throughout all of the member organizations that belong to the IFD, which also includes the uh, Russian organization, uh, Chinese organization in India, and you know, European countries that are involved in it. Then they will distribute it out amongst their membership. It'll be published. They, they actually use two languages over there for publication, English, and German are the standards for all organizations. So when this is all said and done, that, that's a, it's a pretty uh, pretty good honor. I enjoy doing it. I love working with them on the tech side, and um, they're doing some great work over there. Yeah, it really it's it's one of the the biggest honors that I can think of. You know, our involvement with IFD it means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to you, John. Yep. So as always, we end with a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, John, what I wanted to do is turn to this week's question, um, and I think I can probably provide a little bit of input, but I'll turn it over to you as well. So, this is coming from the residential side, and it's from Sam. Sam wants to know, you know, what is the best practices and procedures for removal of fasteners and nails on a project after completion? So, I can tell you from a legal perspective, Sam, what I like to do is, regardless of whether it's a residential contract or it's a commercial contract, I like to put in there, you know, a provision about cleanup that you'll take reasonable steps to clean it up. But I also like to put a disclaimer for, you know, nails and fasteners. You'll do your best to, to uh, make sure that you get them. But if for some reason somebody steps on one or you get in trouble, you've got a legal disclaimer there that kind of protects you. Um, you know, obviously magnetic sweeps, things like that are what I'm familiar with. But John, why don't you talk a little bit about, I guess, best practices for job cleanup? Sure. Uh, happy to uh, answer Sam's question. Um, so what I always like to do from the business practical operational side, one is wherever possible, whether it is a commercial building or residential building, uh, tarp protection, you know, plastic tarp, canvas tarp, whatever you're using even rolled out plastic for that matter, because one, it's easier to clean up, two, it gives you a limited protect, limit, 
more area of protection, right? Um, side of the building, so forth, even though the nails are going to fall down on the ground, cover the grass, cover the parking lot. Magnetic sweeps are great, but a lot of the nails that you use could be aluminum, stainless, may not get picked up, so you need to do more than that. Do a sweep, do an inspection, take some video. Video is worth a thousand uh, words later on if there's an issue. And then other than that, what I recommend that you do is that you keep a sample of all the different nails that you may have because this way, if it ever comes back at you, you can prove out what's going on with the nails. So uh, that ends another uh, week's Law & Mortar. As always, as always, we wanna thank you guys. Really appreciate your support. You know, We are the number one rated construction law podcast out there. We'd like to uh, make sure we thank our listeners. Always appreciate it. Um, if you ever have any questions or you want us to answer your question on air, feel free to hit me up at tcotney at cottonycl.com. John, how can they get you? That's Jay Kenny at CottonyCL.com. Great. Well, thank you guys so much and stay tuned next week for another episode of Lawn Mortar. Have a great week.